In the world of songwriting, there are songs that are successful and songs that are not. Songs that are artistically successful accomplish what the composer or the songwriter set out to accomplish. They say what the writer wanted to say and they connect with people in the way that the writer wanted that to happen. And very often, the difference between a successful song and a not so successful song is what we call the hook. A hook is a phrase um, of words or music or a combination of the two that repeats in just the right way and in the right places in the song that it snags in your head. And having listened to the song once, your brain starts to anticipate it, starts to expect it. And it's one of those things where you can start singing along with a song before you've really learned it because the hooks work. For example, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy now. That is like the hookiest song ever. And once it's in your head, you're probably never, ever going to get it out. So like, you know, apologies for that. But I bet I made my point. In the song that we're looking at, Holy, 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 I think it's safe to say that Holy, Holy, Holy is the hook. It serves that purpose, especially when it's sung to that, as we talked about last week, that tonic major chord that is so easy to recognize, easy to remember, and easy to anticipate. But it's more than that. It's far more than just the hook. It's far more than something that makes the song catchy. Holy, holy, holy is one of the most, I don't know, powerful, precious phrases in the lexicon of Christian worship. We find it in two places in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Revelation, both of which record it as being sung by angels who are in the throne room of God, who are eternally singing the song to him and about him so that all creation can hear it and declaring that he is holy, holy, holy. And when we sing this hymn, we are singing the same thing along with them, in unison with them. We are singing holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. That is our song that early in the morning rises to him. When we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy is one of those words that we need to understand. We need to have a definition for this. It's not an easy everyday life metaphor, like father, like son. We need to actually ask ourselves, okay, what does that word mean? And when we go into our theological dictionaries and our Bible commentaries, there are sort of two go-to definitions that um, come into play. The first one is a definition that talks about purity, the absence of sin, the absence of pollution, uh, being in line with God's purposes in the world. Unfortunately, that part of the, um, that, that definition is often applied negatively and derisively even when we say things like, oh, he is so holier than thou, by which we mean he is arrogant and he thinks that he is morally superior to the people around him and he thinks he's always right. He is so holy. The second definition is more to the point. The second definition is that idea of being set apart for God's purposes. The word is applied to Jesus himself, who was perfectly in tune with God's purposes for his life. It's applied to objects, plates and bowls and cups and tables that uh, are made of particular materials in a particular way to a certain standard, and that they are then uh, cleansed and ritually set aside to be used only directly 
in the service of God or in worship. We can use the word holy for spaces and places that we've set apart, places like the holy of holies in the temple and before that in the tabernacle, which was the deepest place within the, the building where very few people were allowed to go and where God was most directly found and experienced. The word can also be used for other people besides Jesus. It can be used uh, throughout scripture for people who are set apart for God's purposes. People like John the Baptist, who was set apart from before his birth to do God's work in the world. God made him holy. Um, other people, like for example Moses, had that experience not for their whole life, maybe, but for part of their life when they were called to accomplish something in particular that God wanted done. For Moses, I think that that road begins at a particular event that you may be familiar with. We call it the burning bush. The burning bush. Moses was uh, working as a shepherd because he was on the run. He was hiding because he had done something, got himself in trouble. And so he was out in the wilderness with his flock of sheep. And one day he, uh, he noticed something weird over there. There was a bush and it was like glowing or sparkling or flaming or something, but it wasn't burning per se. And he thought, well, that's really weird. So I'm going to go and see what that's all about. So as Moses came closer to that bush, he heard God speak. God said Moses' name and he said, don't come any closer. Take off your shoes because you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses, he knew that name. He knew who this God was and he thought, oh, willikers. So he took off his shoes and he covered his face in fear. I understand the fear thing. I would definitely feel that way in that moment. But rereading this passage, I was struck by, I say that a lot, I was struck by, you'd think I'd have more bruises. I was struck by the taking off your shoes thing. I wondered why did God tell Moses to take off his shoes? It seemed more like God would say something like, Moses, you're on holy ground, get out, you're gonna ruin it. But instead he says, take off your shoes. So looking into the commentaries, I, uh, I found a few different possible explanations for that. The first one responds to the question basically by saying, well, God said it because he said it. And why are you asking why? He said it, so do it. Not super helpful. The second explanation is a bit more plausible. That one suggests that God was asking Moses for a culturally appropriate sign of respect, something that Moses would have done if he had gone into the throne room of an earthly king. He would have taken off his shoes as a sign of humility. So that's plausible. The third one is a little bit more pragmatic. It suggests that God thought that Moses might panic. And so if he takes off his shoes, he's less likely to run away across the rough ground. And he's also less likely to you know, impulsively come closer when he's been told not to. So he was told to take off his shoes so that he would stay put. So yeah, that's plausible. Or, a brief footnote. This next point is something that just occurred to me as I was thinking about this talk. It's not something that I've been able to, uh, to find in any of the commentaries. It's not something that I've heard anybody else say. 
whenever I personally hear something that I've never heard before. I always want to double check it. I always look it up. I always ask people who I respect. I always take it with a grain of salt. So in that spirit, here is point number four. I wonder if in say, saying to Moses, you are standing on holy ground, take off your shoes. If God might have been issuing to Moses an invitation, an invitation to participate fully in what God is doing in that place, in that moment, to make full, barefoot, dig your toes in contact with the ground that God has declared holy and had set aside, and for Moses to be willing to accept that same treatment. Moses would have known that there was nothing intrinsically special about this ground. It was dirt. And sheep are creatures of habit. They would have followed the same paths repeatedly. He had probably been here before. He had probably walked past that bush before. His sheep had probably stood there and nibbled on that bush before. There's no indication in the text that after this amazing thing happened and, and Moses took a deep breath and put his shoes back on, that he then filled his pockets with this holy soil and, and snapped off some pieces of this special bush to take with him, just in case they had mystical powers. There's no indication in the text that Moses gave a special name to this location. There's no sign that Moses ever came back in the days to come as a pilgrimage because there was something special about this place. It had only been set aside on this one day, temporarily, so that God could create a threshold where Moses could stand and hear from God and be heard, where Moses could make contact. There was nothing special about Moses, except, except that when God invited him to stand, afraid, alone, vulnerable, to stand in a place that God had made holy, and to be made holy himself, Moses said, yes. Later on, Moses would quote God's word to God's people. When God said to them, be holy just as I am holy. And the context for that is a whole body of instruction on how to live lives that honor God and that would build them together into a unified people. Later on in scripture, um, Peter, in the first letter that he wrote, in the first chapter of that book, Peter quotes Moses, quoting God, and he says, "You have it, it is written, be holy as I am holy. And again, the context of that book is a body of instruction on how to live lives that honor God. Practical things like have your mind ready for action. Live as children of an eternal Father. Live in obedience to the truth of God's word. Love each other earnestly. Rid yourselves of deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Be living stones that are built into a spiritual house. Be holy for God is holy. The point of all this, I think, is that God is inviting us into holiness. He is inviting us to be set aside, to be part of 
who he is and what he is accomplishing in his kingdom. Holiness is not a set of do's and don'ts. God is not holy because he doesn't tell lies. God is holy because he is accomplishing his purpose. And he does not contradict himself. It's not a set of do's and don'ts like, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with boys who do. Holiness is an identity. It's born of that barefooted, full-hearted contact with Yahweh as he works his purposes in the world. I'm going to end this with some words of Jesus. Just before he went to the cross, just before he fulfilled that purpose for his life, he prayed for his disciples. He prayed for us, literally for you and for me. He prayed that we would be able to follow in Moses' footsteps, to take that step to say yes to God's holiness, to God's set-apartness, God's purposes in the world. This is what he prayed for you and for me. Father, sanctify them, make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. I sanctify myself, I dedicate myself, I serve you completely with my whole self. I consecrate myself, I make myself holy for them so that they also may be sanctified, may be made holy, may be purified, may be set apart for your purpose and your kingdom in the world by your truth. And I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. Be holy as he is holy.